first question I'm going to answer is talking about the importance of Ayoka Chinzera. <clears throat> um, in the early 90s, I had the opportunity to study with Tony K. Bambara, black feminist writer, screenwriter, and filmmaker. And she told me that I really needed to check out this work from a bad sister named Ayoka Chinzera. She's always been somebody who I thought was like on the cutting edge, avant-garde, ahead of her time, always looking to do new things and stay ahead of the fray. Professor Ayoka Chinzira is kind of unlike any other professor I've had before. One of the things that I really took away from her class was thinking about media differently. I had never met a black woman who was a filmmaker that just really knew so much about the industry and was ready to just take time out to just teach us everything about it. Professor Chinzir is giving a lot of young women the opportunity to explore new forms of media and technology and to actually use their creativity to create new things or improve on old things. My name is Ioka Chenzira. I'm also known as Io. Some people around Spelman College call me Dr. A, Dr. AC, Professor Chenzira, AC, I answer to it all. Much, I think my background in film comes out of a combination of being a concert dancer and a still photographer. Uh, film is essentially still pictures moving or dancing. And one day I was in my lab at New York University where I was an undergraduate student and I wanted my photography to say more and I think that that moved into, helped me move into the moving image world. For me, her work is very influential because she has crossed all genres. She's done documentary, she's done feature, experimental. Um, she's always centralizing the voices and lives and perspectives of black women. I had the opportunity to really be introduced to Ayoka's work through her um, first feature film called Alma's Rainbow. A very moving film for myself, but also really important because it was one of the first feature-length films that have been put out in terms of mainstream society. Usually when black women filmmakers are making films, or historically I should say, we've had to kind of pass the tape along, so to speak, or you have to wait for a film festival to see it. But at that time, it was actually playing at a theater. So for me, that that was very influential, particularly as a young, early 20-something, um, barely 20-something filmmaker who was like, I want to be a filmmaker. I came up as a cinematographer back in the you know in the mid 70s and um, and I shot a lot of films so I um, I was aware of a lot of the technical aspects of filmmaking and, and I and I realized that she was too a lot of the other filmmakers that I knew at the time were not so much into the technical side of it they were just interested in being directors I remember in the mid 80s uh, she asked me to uh, if I'd be interested in getting involved with a uh, film development company that she and a couple of other filmmakers were getting ready to do. And I agreed. I, I thought it was a great idea. I also remember it was around that time that um, she got her first Macintosh computer. I think I spent a lot of time at her house just gawking at the thing. It was basically a little thing about this big and it was, it was a major accomplishment at 512 uh, megabytes that was the, the the maximum of this computer and we were like all like amazed that this thing could do what it could do and I remember going to a seminar and they were talking about this new Macintosh computer this little 512 and all the things that it could do and we we're trying to figure out how we could use this in filmmaking Ayoka came up with this idea she said why don't we use this to create edit decision lists it's the same thing and the guy was like amazed and he's like he looked at her and he said well why do you want to do that this is a computer, you can do so many other things with it. Why do you want to do edit decision list? She saw beyond just the fact that it could do word processing, uh, Excel spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff. She, she saw it as a way to be creative. Uh, oh, and she, as a result of that, she wound up making a, um, uh, an animation movie about uh, sort of following the, 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 you know, the idea of dance from Africa to America and she used that computer to basically create an animation stop motion film about that experience. She was really ahead of her time because now you, you look around and, and just look right back here. Actually, this is a Macintosh computer that I'm working at and it's, 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 it's become ubiquitous, I mean, in terms of editing. One of the things I think about when I, when I think of Ayoka is how she 
is really a w way ahead of the curve in a lot of things in, in terms of new technology, in terms of uh, looking at funding from non-traditional sources for making a film. But I think that it really is that technology area that really kind of puts Ioka sort of in, a, in another class. Uh, I run a media arts center in Philadelphia, a place called Scribe Video Center. And in the mid-1980s, we began a uh, artists uh, in in-person screening series where uh, filmmakers who were in the midst of projects would come and talk about their work and about their creative process. We held these screenings at the Divine Lorraine Hotel, which is this wonderful um, Victorian building that is owned and run by the Peace Mission Movement, which was Father Divine's organization. Mother Divine was kind enough to let us use her the private dining room as our screening hall. Uh, so Ioka comes down to New York, and I remember Ioka's mom was there. Actually, my mom came too, and uh, we had about 20 people. Ioka comes with what looks like a small duffel bag. It looked like a cash register inside. And what she pulls out is a Macintosh computer. Now, Macs really just came out in 1984, so this was really at the beginning of the use of Macintosh, these portable computers. And at, you, you've got to remember, in the mid-1980s, most people weren't even using computers, much less portable computers. And there really weren't portable computers. I mean, people really kind of kept them in one place. But Ayoka brought down her Macintosh. And on the Macintosh, she had all of these uh, sampled animations that she had constructed for her films, The Jota and the Boogie Spirit. Uh, and in some ways, it, it really kind of stretched our minds to think that computers could be this wonderful partner in terms of media making. So Ayoka, always ahead of the curve. Ayoka is, is recognized as the first African-American female animator. That's huge. I also want to say that she was the first William and Camille Olivia Hanks Cosby endowed chair at the college across any discipline. Her appointment was in the arts, but she was our first in 2001. That was a historic milestone. Thank you, Dr. Manley, Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, administrators, for this tremendous honor. So as you can see, Ioka has a um, legacy of firsts. I can recall as if it were yesterday, uh, the approach of Ioka Chinzera and I went to New York and she and I had a meeting uh, about her coming to Spelman as the first uh, Cosby Chair in the Arts and that would have been uh, between the year 2000 and 2001. I was extremely excited that the first Cosby Chair in the Arts was this filmmaker who had actually been to Spelman some years before because I thought she would bring to Spelman the uh, skills and the expertise and the feistiness that I think that the classes were thinking about when they started that chair. When I arrived as president in 2002, Professor Chinzira was completing her first year as a Cosby chair and I was delighted that she was interested in staying on. When we talked about what she imagined she might do, she shared with me her idea of the Digital Moving Images Salon and it sounded like a wonderful way to engage students in her craft. What DMIS does is, first of all, it's housed in the Women's Center, which is very a very interesting place for an entity like the Digital Moving Image Salon. It really makes women's studies a very uh, provocative entity, not only within Spelman and within the HBCU system, but I think generally, because at Spelman we have the Women's Center 
grounded in history, theory, and critical analysis, and now we have the digital media component. So women are not only learning how to take on issues of activism and social justice through text, but they're now beginning to uh, tell the stories through a digital media process. And so I'm very, very excited about that. What IOPA brought to the Women's Center, we could never have imagined when, we, when the Women's Center was founded in, in, in 1981. So that means that students, our women's studies majors and minors, as well as students in general who may not even be thinking about women's studies as a major and minor, could come and take courses uh, in the program that they could not uh, have anywhere else on campus. I come from a background um, at a university where I've spent most of my life as a professor teaching students who have already decided that they are going to be filmmakers. This is the first time I've ever been engaged with students who are not principally interested in filmmaking, but very interested in filmmaking. <laughs> so I get lawyers, engineers, um, fine artists, uh, people in, in anthropologists, and it's, it's quite fascinating because what they're looking at is the, the technology to be used for a wide variety of voices. And so the DMIS program is set up to facilitate that even though the primary context is looking at um, issues related to social justice and women's oral narratives. Professor Chandera had just begun the Digital Moving Image Salon a little before I, I got to Spelman and it was kind of where I made myself a home on Spelman's campus and it is such an integral part of the young women's lives there who are involved in it. Both people who know that they are interested in, in the moving image and people who are just kind of finding it out and discovering what it has to offer. I became an independent study major in film and it was only made possible because of the work that Professor Chidzera had done to create the space um, to study that way. There were nine of us, by the way, that were um, allowed into the class and you had to be at least a junior or a senior with at least, um, I think, three women's studies courses under your belt. The way it worked was first semester, um, we researched our topics and um, learned how to, how to make a documentary and began to, to start shooting footage and then second semester um, did the bulk of the shooting and editing and essentially created are student documentaries. Most people when they think student documentaries they think oh okay you know not necessarily uh, as good or really amateur if you will but interestingly enough all three groups um, managed to produce pretty amazing documentaries. One of the things we focused on in our documentary was the student actions at Spelman around Nellie coming to campus who was supposed to come to campus to do a bone marrow registration drive but some students had some questions about you know, you want us to help you save your sister's life, but you promote all of these other kind of problematic representations of black women. Nellie wanted to come to campus as part of a blood drive for his sister, and the women who um, invited him there also wanted to talk with him specifically about his video tip drill. He issued a public statement saying that he had been disinvited by Spelman College, which was not true. And it created a lot of media attention, and that was something that we wanted to document and show how Spelman students uh, stood up. They took Nellie on, and they, they succeeded in moving forward the discussion about um, much of rap, much of current day rap being misogyny, you know, with a beat. She tries to get us to get a topic that we will not only embrace and enjoy, but that's also something that will, we, that will show us a broader picture of our society as a whole. You might look at something like the Kobe Bryant case or R. Kelly or just things that we, the way we incorporate and socialize in, uh, within, I guess, the college atmosphere, talking about, you know, oh, what is she doing? What is she wearing? Where is she going? And it basically sets up this image of what a victim is. And if you don't fit the stereotype of, um, blonde, white, female, you basically cannot be victimized. And that's something that I'm delving into in my topic. In November 2008, I got the opportunity of a lifetime to travel to Istanbul, Turkey with Professor Chinzira. 
Um, I found out when I was doing a little bit of editing with my partner Jennifer Buck, we actually got an email from Doc asking if either of us had a passport. And we kind of looked at each other like, wonder, wonder why she wants to know if we have a passport. So we responded and she said, good that you both have one because I'm traveling to Turkey and I wanted to know if you guys wanted to come. So of course we're freaking out, like trying not to scream when we know it's an opportunity where we should be screaming. While in Istanbul, our first priority was to come up with a presentation that we would share with some students and faculty at the university. Um, it would show our process in creating the installation that we did on the Hurricane Katrina. When I think about the trip to Istanbul and all the things that I got out of it, it's kind of hard to put it um, in a short amount of words. Um, I learned, of course, a lot of educational things, um, but I also learned um, what it's like to be an outsider. I was obviously from America traveling to another country, so it was very interesting to learn those customs and those cultures and hear that language and just be a part of something that I wasn't used to. And in doing all of that, I just learned a lot about myself and, and how our cultures are so different and how I can possibly adopt some of the things that they do there and help myself. Um, my experience with VMIS as a whole has been an excellent experience. It is the hardest I've had to work as long as I can remember. It was extremely hard, but it was so fulfilling. And as a whole, again, it was just a great experience. You know, I think it's really important that we come to terms with the fact that visual literacy is not the strong point of contemporary society. And her work is so very important because it combats that. So many people can look at everything from nightly news to music videos and really not have a clear understanding or even the vocabulary with which to talk about what they've seen or witnessed. So her work is, is vital. It's vital, vital to women at a liberal arts college. It's vital to society. She teaches us ways to look at, at images in ways that we never thought possible or even credible. And so her work is extraordinary and it's something that we really cannot overlook. And it's something that Spellman has certainly benefited from and continues to benefit from. To be a founder and director of the Digital Moving Image Salon. So creating a, a space where generations of black women will be able to be armed with their cameras to tell their stories. So to literally document their lives, but also to envision their stories, to, to have imagination and creativity. So while as a documentarian, it's very important that we document our lives, I think it's also important that we have imaginations and create a lives that maybe we've never even thought of. And so through that, Ioka is definitely centralizing the margins and making visible the invisible. And to quote, quote Tony K. Bambara, that is the role of the artist, really, to make revolution irresistible. And I think that that is what Ioka has done and continues to do. Ioka's work is important in on a number of levels, uh, one of which is that she has um, consistently articulated this uh, uncompromising perspective of black women um, in various places. She has worked in such a variety of media, you know, in animation, uh, in uh, you know, the film and the play that she wrote and the film that she's done about South Africa and now the kind of technological platforms that she's working in. Uh, yeah. But in all these other arenas as well, you know, they've been influential and really trailblazing. And so she's stepped out of the conventional patterns and managed to articulate a very uh, individual and unique voice uh, in a climate that is very often hostile uh, to individual and unique voices. Left the city, my mama, she said, don't come back home. These kids won't kill them. You know, at Io's core, uh, she's an activist. And, uh, and, and, and what I mean by that is she, she's looking to be a catalyst for change, getting a person to change the way they think, the way they see a situation. And so that really is the, the starting point for her taking on any project. Uh, one example is uh, she just, her work was featured uh, at uh, a huge symposium in Singapore. No other, there were no other people of color uh, involved with this, uh, certainly no Americans and no, no other African Americans in, involved with this project. And so her, her intent there was to help these other uh, digital media experts understand uh, 
how exclusionary the field is and to have them start to think differently, again, being a catalyst for how uh, they move forward. IO challenges you to think about a uh, situation from all angles. I've seen her do this with some of her students and uh, I've seen students that I've met early in the year uh, that by the end of the year when they turn in their project, they're, they've been transformed and you can see the way they carry themselves. Some of them decide that that they want to pursue documentary, documentary filmmaking as a result of her experience. But the biggest thing that she, she confides in me is that she's really just trying to get them to think and solve problems in their head and, 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 and uh, help them think about how to apply uh, problem solving skills to any, any piece of their lives. Um, she's, a, she's a very special person and a gift to uh, any, anyone who should come to meet her and know her. She has affected my self-esteem a great deal. I really didn't know that black women could do what she does. Like, I've never seen somebody on top of it. It makes me realize that it's something that I can do. Nothing seemed beyond the realm of possibility. And I have Professor Trinzer to thank in part for helping me experience that through Spellman and DMIS and know that I can achieve absolutely anything going forward. When it was time to choose what to do after college, I just reflected back on you know moments that I had in college that were memorable. That's when I started looking into different programs for the area of documentary film, and I came across one that was going to be at Syracuse, and it would be the first year of the program. It was called Documentary Film and History. And so I was one of five students selected for that program, and I was the only black female in the program. Because of DMIS, I was prepared for the program, you know, not only production-wise, but also once we did start doing productions, I felt like I was confident and comfortable to do the stories and, and to just produce what I had a passion and vision for, despite the angles that they thought I should go with it and which I didn't think was really going to give justice to the project. And so DMIS gave me that courage and that understanding about the importance of our stories. Okay, so growing up with a mom who is a filmmaker and a professor, and my dad was a performance artist, oh no, we had all types of creative mishigash going on up in that house, okay? But it was really fantastic because my mom would take me around the world with her on these different film productions that she'd be working on. And there was this one particular time she took, took me to Austria with her, um, this production she was, she was doing. And there was a goat in this film. And that goat's name was Susie. And Susie the goat, for whatever reason, would only listen to me. And so right then and there, I was pronounced the goat herder. Oh yes, all of eight years old. It might have been a little bit older, but still, I was herding goats. But thinking back at all those experiences that she involved me with throughout my childhood, whether I was working as a production assistant, or sitting in casting sessions, or sleeping like on the editing room floor, I remember waking up one time and she was cutting construction papers and uh, cutouts of different black women's hairstyle. And, you know, next thing I know, she had made the film Hairpiece, which was another one of her first uh, animated films. Reformed colored girls would no longer have to wait for a hurricane to have their head a blow in the wind. The miracle was here. And I remember in my senior year, I was studying drama at Performing Arts in Manhattan. And when it came time to apply for college, I remember a lot of my friends' parents telling them that, you know, it was time to wake up and smell the coffee, that they were not going to be, you know, paying for any kind of artistic college education. But I instead was encouraged to continue to nurture my artistic exposures. And I'll never forget my mom telling me at the time that the tools that I would learn from having creative training would enable me to be and do anything. I think that I think that Ayoga's work with DMIS is in service to the way we as women are coming out, m moving away from the images that have been set for us for centuries and coming to an, a, 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 other uh, blueprints for our life experiences, their meaning, 
and their relevance not only to our own lives but to the lives of our families and to the universe really. We're still defining ourselves, we're still coming out. I think it's very important for black women's stories to be told because if we don't tell our stories, no one else will, or at least not the way we want them to be told. We certainly see today the um, proliferation of images of black women that are not empowering, that don't celebrate who we are as whole people, uh, often just reducing us to what, as I like to say, body parts. And I think it's important for us to say we are more than that. And if we, as I said, if we don't tell our own stories, no one else will. at a juncture where we are actually growing DMIS with the support of both the provost and uh, the college president, Beverly Daniel Tatum, who has been very supportive of this effort from the beginning. We're growing into mobile technology. We're using cell phones to tell stories. We're using uh, game technology. Uh, we're growing into interactive, um, interactive sculptures, and we will continue to do our, our lens-based digital media work. So it's an, ex it's, a, it's an exciting time, and I'm very, very proud of my girls. They are stellar. <laughs>